All right, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry that it's hotter than blazes in here. Um, I'm glad for those of you who are wearing shorts for the staff, if you've got blazers on, feel free to take them off. So we're here to do a mid-biennium budget review. As I'll go over a few brief reminders, a lot of you were in our budgeting session a few weeks ago, but I'm gonna give you just a brief overview. Um, Allison's gonna do some revenue and debt review, and then I'm gonna talk a little more about, we call it personal services in the budget, about personnel costs and then significant changes for mid-biennium, a little bit about the CIP and the capital improvement plan will include Pearson Park. I'll summarize and talk a little bit about a few years out and then uh, we'll do a presentation as we had previously discussed about the Boykin Donahue campus phase one. Uh, this isn't a four hour um, reiteration of the budget by Alice and I. This is just hitting highlights for you. We're happy to take questions as you go or as we go or whatever works best for the council. The goal is for you to have information about what's in here and we've got staff assembled who can answer questions. Anybody have any questions before we start? All right. I'm not, I'm not on the mic. I can get on the mic. This is this mic, um, just to remind everybody, I'll be happy to use this. This is recording because we will post this on our website. So the mics that we're wearing, but I'll be happy to use this. So if you're going to ask questions um, and if I have other staff members speak, if it's easier for you to hear, we will use this. All right, can you hear me? Is it making a difference? It doesn't seem to make a difference. Anybody hear it? Huh. It's a little better? Okay. So, as I said, this is not a redo of the budget. It's basically we're adjusting revenue projections um, um, based on our year to date knowledge of, of what we had and a lot on what, where fiscal 22 became final. We're updating our capital project expenditures based on design and construction schedules. There's a lot of carry forward. You see big numbers in the budget. The big numbers you're seeing a lot of them, and we'll talk about that later. Carry forward just simply means it was budgeted in a previous year or it's budgeted in 23 and not slated to either be fully spent or finished. So we're moving it to 24. So you're just taking money that was already budgeted and you continue to shift it until projects are done. Um, and then we've got new opportunities like we'll talk about Pearson Park, emergency repairs, and then other things that, that have happened, insurance rates, electricity, things like that that we'll talk about that we had no knowledge certain aspects of this is going to happen last summer. So why am I going to talk about fiscal 2022? It's just to, to let you know that our revenues outperformed our project projections by 4.3% or $5.2 million, which that's more money in, in our coffers. And you know, in part, some of that has to do with our population growth and then just general as us being an economic center in the region, our expenses were less, so we had more revenue and we, we spent less um, than the approved budget, 4.4 million in operating budgets and 4.2 million less in capital budgets, and that happens for a variety of reasons. One of the things, the people that you see in this room do not spend money that is their budgets that if they don't need to spend it. Everybody in this room is very diligent about, just because it's a line item budgeted doesn't mean they're going to spend it. If they don't need office supplies or they don't need a new postage machine or whatever, they won't spend it. So my staff couldn't be more diligent about not spending it just because it's there. They're always a good steward of the taxpayer dollars um, and we're very committed to that. Ooh, I like to jump around, I bumped the mouse. So a few things about capital projects, you know, as, as typical, and a lot of you have been on the council several terms, we're always behind on capital projects. Right now, as we talk about in council meetings, we've got supply chain issues, we've got bidding issues, and we've just got time and space. The weather is wonky, it challenges us, and sometimes things like environmental services and public works, we're still waiting. We got one generator, right? But we still need the other one. So that's holding up the Boykin project, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, you know, our capital investments approached in, in 22, 19.9 .9 million, and, and that was 4.2 million less than, than expected. So now I'm going to have Allison, that's just a quick 22, and why some things may be showing up in Allison's side of the ledger um, that you weren't expecting. I'm usually pretty loud. Do I need this? Can y'all hear me? It's, okay. it's more the, it's the sound it's the, panels. The sound panels, okay, well. This is, this is a karaoke mic. This is what this is here for. <laughs> so I won't sing. But <laughs> you got this. <laughs> One of my favorite songs. Um, so I could, this could be really quick. Revenue is up. 
the end, <laughs> that is it. Um, it is up, and I think it's up um, in a way that nobody expected when we did the original budget for 23 and 24. I think um, recession thoughts, all the things that have been going on since the pandemic, even most recently in May and June, the expectation was still that we will see recession by the end of the year. This week and a few weeks ago are the first times where I'm starting to hear there's a lot more optimism about that now. Um, um, unemployment rate is tremendously low. Growth continues to be there, a little slower for a few months. It is expected to be even bigger again as we see what happens in July and August when those reports happen. So recession is not as much there, but we still want to think very carefully about that because of some of our revenue sources being so volatile. So sales tax being the, the biggest one, it's, it's incredibly important that we don't forget how quickly that can change. So just to remind you, that our top 10 revenue sources, and these revenue sources are 90% of our general fund budget. So they are the most important. And I think that this graph demonstrates the significance of sales tax. That it's, it's that blue one that's huge. That is what we're seeing. And sales tax is higher than it has ever been. Um, does it seem to be slowing down anytime soon? Um, we have some new commercial things. Prices are higher, so many things are going on. Um, some commercial things like Mr. Parsons shirt um, that are contributing to that. Can't tell you how much that is, but I can tell you that it contributes. Um, things like that, so we have a lot going on. And so you see that our sales tax is still, it's big, and I'll talk about it specifically. I'm only gonna cover three, our top three, because they're the ones that changed the most significantly from what we budgeted originally, and so I'll work through those with you. But the top five are the ones where I have the actual amount showing in the graph just so, so you can see what sales tax means to the city. It's tremendous. Okay, so this is the graph that you get in your monthly financial reports. You see it by month, and we have to look at it that way because things change so much for us from month to month. Just as a reminder that football season is huge. This year we have Georgia, um, Georgia, which was moved from November to October, is actually being played on September 30th this year. It means something very different for our September revenue and, you know, in the, in the, from October last year and November in the past. We have Alabama at home this year, so we have a lot of things to consider. A new coach, just everything brings a lot of excitement. So watching those months very carefully is something we, that we do all the time. Christmas shopping season, um, the spring, winter and spring, if you've noticed, has been a lot different with a very good basketball team. We're seeing that time period be important as well, so we watch that. June through August are typically the lowest months, but if you can, I don't know if this has a pointer. If you can see from this monthly chart, May, June, and July for the bottom line, which is this year, are not as low as they usually are. We're seeing some pretty tremendous sales tax collections. And a little bit of that is the commercial, the things that have changed in commercial, but it also indicates that nobody has stopped spending, which is what everybody thought would happen with inflation. They may be changing how they spend, spending it on different things, but it's still there and we're still seeing it. So that's kind of what it looks like. The line is usually the same. Um, you see spikes depending on the, the type of football season we have and the SEC teams and things like that, but most of the time the line kind of follows the same, the same trend. So just a little history, just a reminder, everybody knows that um, the city's sales tax rate is 4%. It's usually 45 to 50% of general fund revenue for the two proposed, or two mid biennium proposed numbers, that's a, it's about 46% of general fund revenue, which is very significant. So in, for 23, the changes here are pretty much based on what we've already collected. So we know we're going to get this. The mid biennium, Green, the first green column that you see will top 60 million in sales tax revenue this year. And then the projection for 24, um, one thing that we always do, history repeats itself. So we're going to look at a time period over history. You have to factor in the COVID year and all the things like that. But usually when you look at that average, it's, it's pretty realistically conservative to maybe take about half of that. So we don't want to get crazy with what we're expecting, but we also want to be as realistic as we can be. So we're projecting about 3% more in 24. Do I think that will be higher? Probably, probably a little bit higher than that. But we don't want to make purchasing decisions 
if we're not very certain about that. So that's the, the change in sales tax. A lot different than the blue lines, what we thought was going to happen when we were expecting recession and other significant issues. Okay, I always add simplified seller's use, I get that question a lot. Um, one reminder here, this is the 8% that, that are paid on online sales. It's not a sales tax, it is not a city sales tax, it is a state shared tax that is given to us based on our population. And it's for sales across the whole state. Doesn't matter where the purchase went. It's all put in one place and it's divided by population after they, after the state takes their 50% and then whatever we end up with, which right now uh, municipalities get about 30, then it's divided by population. And so we saw that really, really jump up when our population was finally updated from the 2020 census. So we are um, projecting over 5 million um, to finish this year with over 5 million, and that's a big deal. And then 5.2 next year. Again, similar conservative 3% growth rate there. Right. Occupation license is our second largest source. Um, anywhere from 14, it's 14 million, jumped up to 16 million in 2022. Um, some of that, now while unemployment's very low, so it makes a lot of sense that OCC is higher right now, but sometimes we have, I look at Latrice, because sometimes we have people that catch up if, they're, if we're really going after somebody that hasn't paid in a while, so you may see a little jump one year because we've done some collections, and so we're very careful not to forecast based on that because those are one-time things. But this is 12 to 14% of general fund revenue, so it's very important. For mid-biennium, again, based pretty much on what we've already collected with a little bit more for these next couple of months is 16 million. And then 16 and a half um, in 2024. So any questions about that? Okay. And then business license. I didn't share this one with you in the original budget because this is one that um, it, it's been an there's been an interesting impact on it uh, from the pandemic. So remember that business licenses are typically calculated on gross receipts from the prior calendar year. So when you look at 2020, the collections, those gross receipts and how low they were during the actual COVID year, well, 2021 is when that was collected. It was based on those gross receipts. So that year was way low. You see that 11.9, that's the lowest that we had seen in a while. Well, now we're seeing it really pick back up. Not only do we have new businesses, we have gross receipts that are so much higher and, and that makes sense because sales tax is high. All of that makes sense when you put it all together. And so business license includes general business license, which is what you typically think we're talking about, but also in that is residential rental, which is one and a half percent of gross receipts on rental property, that, like apartments and things like that. Commercial rental, if you're renting out a space for commercial use, that, that is actually a lot lower, is a very insignificant revenue source, uh, but it's there. And remember, in a commercial, Latrice reminded me today, that in a, in a commercial location like that, the license probably should be lower because there's going to be a business there that is generating other revenue. So it may be sales tax or whatever they're generating there, where residential rental is not. That one and a half is all we get. And then contractor's licenses is, um, quarter of 1% that they pay when they permit. And so that's when the contractor permits for a, for a development or a, whatever they're gonna do and build, that's a, that's a business license type thing for the contractor for that project. All of that is grouped together here. 14 million proposed for by the end of this year and then 14.1, a very, very small increase uh, as a conservative estimate. Allison, did you yeah. say what, how much the first one was, the general business license? They're all different, right? Primary, so it depends on the type of business. There's a, there's a big, nice schedule that I do not know all of, all of the rates for those, so, yeah. And, and the contractor's license, you said that when they apply for a permit, it's based on what? Is it based on the value of what they're fixing to build, or exactly. what? Based on that, so what? It, and, and pretty much the same way the permit is based on that valuation. This is too. We see that one 
flow with permits the way. So usually when construction permits are lower, then you're going to see that be lower. And if they have overrun on their construction costs, do we collect additional That's the right question. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, what they, they come in, they have a flat license fee originally. So they pay 155 every year. And they pay on the construction cost, the valuation of the job. They have to go back to get additional permit. I'm deferring to John on this one because he would have to, he would be able to tell me if they collect any addition. If they come back, I'll ask you if any increase we will say that's the valuation and the way additional quarter one percent and permit fees. Thank you. Any other questions about that? Third largest revenue source for us. Has the revocation process, has that been effective in getting some of our past due folks to pay? Just the idea that it's an option? Absolutely. Okay. But I think to say that we might be to you with one fairly soon you is... You will see one. You're yeah. going to see one. Yeah. Then it's a, it's a long time issue, so... But yeah. there being consequences is that's a big deal it's important and has definitely mm -hmm. helped us speed up some things with with a few so. yeah a lot of people got in before you adopted it okay i always throw construction permits up there we know how volatile that is um, this chart is always interesting to me but you know construction permits during the covid year were the highest that we had ever seen and then it just kind of started slowly going down. It's pretty much leveled out right now. So we do still see it, but it's staying about the same. So I'm not messing, I have not changed the budget at all from what we had in there and the original budget. It's gonna stay the same. It's one of those that we just kind of have to see what happens with that. Okay, it's the eighth largest source. And so the first slide that I showed, those were in order and simplified seller's use. Let me jump back real quick because I just think it's interesting. Simplified seller's use jumped above, above lodging tax when it got adjusted for the population. So it is now our sixth largest source, which is pretty amazing. Lodging tax is still there. And I don't have a slide on lodging tax, but you know from the monthly reports that continues to kind of follow sales tax. It's, it's, it's completely recovered from the pandemic and it steadily kind of increases. And we'll see that change as these additional hotels come on. Uh, simplified seller's yeah, population that changed every year or is it, is it every census? Every census, yeah. which is going to be not good, not good not for really us. Good. I mean, it wasn't good for a while, um, but yeah, it's only going to well, be Well, think about it. Mobile just moved up in status by the large annexation and they also can't touch this, but it wouldn't surprise me if they tried to bring legislation forward to do so, knowing Mobile. Yeah. yeah. A couple of other significant things. We're earning interest, y'all, on our investments, which is amazing for, I can't even count how many years our interest rates were like 0 .001. Um, so it's actually fun investing money right now and being able to choose, look around and choose things and do requests for proposals and, you know, have investments in, in, you know, we're very, our investment policy is that safety is number one. We don't do anything that where there is a risk um, very risky type things and then liquidity and interest earnings is not our primary focus but when we're in a time like this when we can't earn interest we're going to do everything we can to do that so you see the increase I mean a million and it probably will be about a million and a half to that budget um, and, and over what we had in fiscal 22 uh, 400 percent over what we budgeted because we just didn't realize that it was going to grow so fast um, the other thing just that I just wanted to note is one of the increases, because you're seeing in your book that the total revenue is a pretty big increase to the budget, that w what we had budgeted originally. This is sale of surplus assets, is that Indian Pines transaction where we did sell part of that land, although it's going to go, it, it went out to, to help with the construction, but that is a revenue for us because the money came in. So there's a, a transaction as a revenue and there's one as an expenditure, so you see both. But I have to adjust the budget for that because it is a million and a half dollars or whatever. 1.3 million, I think, is what it was. So big jump there. Total revenue, um, 
for the, by the end of this year, we'll be over 130 million in total revenue. Now, that's not other financing sources, which are transfers or anything like that. That's straight revenue, and 130.6. Now, remember, within that, even in our largest sources, lots of rep, lots of different revenue sources, charges for services, things like that. That stuff can be up and down. And so, in a total, we have to account for the fact that something could be way higher while something else goes down. And so, we have to kind of adjust that. So, in total. You know, this is the expectation for those two years, for the end of this year. And that 130, I mean, we're almost there. So we will see that in, in 23. Any questions there? Okay. Just real quick, so this slide is just to remind you what we talked about in the original budget presentation is what we expected to do with debt. We expected in fiscal 22 to borrow 55 million for soccer complex, Will Beekner Parkway, and the environmental services and public works facility. We did that. And so when I show you the next slide, you'll see that pulled up into the current. Our plans for the other two are the same except for the timing and a little bit in the amounts because we know some things have changed since we first talked about the budget for these other projects and so the debt will adjust. Keep in mind though, these are projections. We, don't, we do not issue debt until we bid, until we know exactly how much we need. We're not gonna borrow way more than we need and we certainly don't wanna borrow less than we need. So this is where we were at the beginning of the biennium and this is where we are now. So the current debt, which is the darker blue, includes that borrowing from fiscal 22. We borrowed 55 million for those projects. Um, the, I have this broken into two issuances right now. The Lake Wilmore, you approved a reimbursement resolution so that when we do issue that debt, we can pay ourselves back for what we've already spent. So that will be, that will happen. And then we have the Boykin improvements and we have the Lake Wilmore multipurpose fields. Same plans, same projects, that's what we plan to borrow for. What I would like to do, because it costs less and we're very close to bidding these other two, Boykin and, and Lake Wilmore Fields, is I want to pull them all together because it makes sense to do them at the same time. And so that may change the timing just a tad. I think 2024B it was planned to be borrowed later in fiscal 2024. But if we do it earlier, we'll just start paying debt service a little bit earlier, but it's going to save us money to do that together. So that may be what we do. Which phase of the Boykin project are we talking about? So the, we're going to go over that, but okay. what we're calling phase one, yeah, which is sure in there, the which is the, at this time, the cultural center, the library, the splash pad, the overall site work and, and parking lot. Does one large issue and save us, save us significant funds, I guess, as opposed to the two and just a better rate and stuff like that, or is it just simply a savings with the closing cost? It's, it's the cost of issuance. Yeah. yeah. So the rate yeah, right, may, exactly. may be better because it's bigger, more people are interested in it, and so the rate can be lower. But it's the cost of issuance. It's a lot of work for, with a lot of people that, that cost. So we'll try to do that if we can. On the debt, key indicators, um, some things that we look for. This is only debt in the general fund. So it's my, what is the impact of debt service just on our general fund fund balance? That's what I need to know when we're thinking about borrowing. And the key indicators are debt service as a percentage of expenditures and then also as a percentage of revenues. Below 10% is always where we want to be. And you might remember me talking last time when we were talking about doing these borrowings that we were going to be right, we were going to be a little over 10% for the first couple of years until some things drop off. But the, this borrowing scenario is we are right at 10% for those first two years and then we start dipping down to 89% because we have some other debt dropping off. So we're in a very good position to do this. The general fund can handle it. We can afford it. And so this is um, definitely probably what will happen. And the school, the school debt that we carry, how does that, this is general fund debt? This is just general fund. And so the school debt's funded by the special School tax. Okay. Yeah. So 16 mil. 16 mil. So what about the um, the streetscape? The model the King Streetscape. It's not borrowing funds. It's not borrowing. Right. It's either cash and we're using some ARPA There's funds for the for the portion. for the water portion. You mean? Water yeah. <laughs> yeah. So rescue plan money for the water line and the rest is just cash out of the general fund. We're not borrowing for that. The project wasn't big enough 
um, compared to other things. So we, we spend a mix of cash and, in essence, we borrow funds also because it's a better use of our Yeah, borrowing our is going to be a very significant mm -hmm. high dollar long term, very long term, not that that's not long term, but very high dollar projects is usually our plan. What are bond rates doing? Do we know? Um, when, well, in the forecast, we're using 5% right now, probably a tad high. Uh, I think four, four, four and a quarter is probably what we would look at right now. A lot different than what we saw when, when rates were low. It was great when we borrowed because we got, you know, we borrowed money for 2%. Um, so that's something. But when I These forecast, also, right? I do 5% just so that we're kind of covered in the debt service. I'm estimating a little bit more than what it will probably come in at. Questions? Okay. He's so thorough. Okay. All right. Thank you, Allison. Just jumping back into a few things, you saw this um, when we did a budget workshop, but it, just a little bit about pers personal services or personnel. I'll show you what we've added on, ooh, on the next slide. But remember, we try to keep personnel costs below 50% um, of, of our general fund, and there, therefore, you'll see our ratios stick in the 37.3% and 38.3%. I want to caution you about something, and all the department heads as well. This doesn't mean that we're actually running that low. When we haven't spent money, those un unspent funds, and I call it in layman's terms, are still sitting in the budget for those other projects. And so if you really kind of trued this up, we're in the high 40% range. And so Allison's run all the calculations. So. I don't want you to think we're horribly understaffed. We're balancing adding staff with our growth, with our facilities changes and so on. But when we don't spend funds on certain projects, we end up in essence with extra cash in the bank that is kind of makes this percentage look lower. The true up is 48 and 49. Yeah, if you exclude capital from yeah. the calculation, we're right below 50%, which yeah. is exactly where we should be. So I don't want you looking at this too as a misnomer and I love all my department heads in the room, but don't assume it's time to add 28 staff people to each department. Um, it's a nice try. So this is kind of where we were. The snapshot on the left is what you saw in the biennial budget presentation. Um, in fiscal 23, we added technically 11 positions. We said nine. The two new ones that have come about fairly recently this spring are Operations and Facilities Division Manager for Public Works. And I just added a workforce development project manager because our industrial workforce development is so robust and also they are helping with things like they help Bucky's, they did other things. And so um, Amy Bravem does a great job in that role, but she is swamped and we need to provide more services. Remember these are turning occupational license fees and that's our, one of our largest remitters our, is our industrial base. And then in fiscal 2024, we still only plan to add the five positions you see there um, but I also on the right want to talk about converted positions. Last year, well during this fiscal 2023, we also converted some park maintenance worker positions, five temporary positions to regular positions, and then we added two new. Why? Because yes, we're adding fields, but we also are adding, we need to maintain, a lot of you remember um, that there was a mess at the soccer complex at one point in time. We are meticulous about maintaining our cemeteries. We do a great job, our crews do a great job, but we need to make sure they have adequate equipment and personnel to handle that. And that's across the board, environmental services, public works, water resource management. This isn't unusual. Um, as we grow, our infrastructure is growing. More road miles to maintain, more right of way to mow, more parks. It's, it's a lot with maintenance, but those things go together. And we do build those things into the budget as we're adding facilities and so on. But, I just wanted, and then we've been converting. Um, Chief Langford has worked um, with the public safety director too to convert some of our, we still have, it's a, we're netting 30 student firefighter positions. Yeah, the end goal 30, but we're incrementally converting to career firefighter. And we talked about that. We're still keeping aspects of that program, but with demands on our volume of calls, particularly in EMS, with demands of class and coverages and new stations and so on. This has been a model that has proven, Kristen Reeder and myself has spent a lot of time uh, with Chief Langford and Public Safety Director Matthews to go over this as well as, as 
Paul registered prior to Will, and this is, this is something that's very needed in the data. So that's just a continuation. I want you to see that that's, that's going on. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. With, with the physics of your 2024 20, to five positions, mm -hmm. okay, I don't see what you have in those five positions, in, uh, I mean, some positions for the new working uh, innovation, you know, when you have complete that. Correct. So what, is that going to actually be? My staff has not sing signaled yet that we need to add on the library side, Ashley. That comes in 25. Yep, so we know what that is, but full completion of that facility, that's not going to be open in fiscal year 24. I mean, that's a, uh, Allison, how, how long of a build out is that? Yeah, so it's going to be a while. You'll see that in, well, we're going to do a one year budget to, as we talked about, you'll see that next summer in the budget. A lot of that will permeate. Um, in terms of pre-planning, that's handled with our existing staff and they are just fine. Um, and, and Library Director Tyler Witten has given me a schedule of things that need to be added and they also work that through our Human Resources Director. Same with Parks and Recreation. We'll talk about many, you know, the staffing of Lake Wilmore, Becky, is, is not fully realized in here yet. Is that correct? The staffing for Lake Wilmore is not fully realized in here yet. We'll do with existing personnel, and there's sometimes in the middle of the year, as you see with the two blue positions, I will add positions when things come online. What we don't want to do is add positions too early, and sometimes when we don't know with timing, we're fine. We, we will come to you and add as needed. Um, the, the important thing is we are adding folks as needed, but we're not going to add more than, than we need. That's not, doesn't do that's any good. The other challenge is, in my career, this has been one of the first times I've seen, it is hard. The people in this room work very hard to find the excellent employees that we have. Um, we also have seen some people leave where they think the grass is greener on the other side and our department heads are seeing a lot of people return to the city of Auburn. We take great care of our employees and the, you can see those that have crews are nodding their heads. Somebody will come sweeping in, especially for those that have CDLs and offer some fantastic bonus to join them and our people will get to wherever they're going and they don't stay very long because they realize the culture is not the same. So that, that's a signal to the great job the department heads and our human resources team do to take good care of our people. And, and as long as there weren't major issues, we do usually welcome them back with open arms. There might be a few people that may not be able to come back. But. And then even in police, you know, Chief Anderson has seen some people from near and far experienced police officers that are, um, they appreciate the amount of funding. You, you, you are willing to fund equipment. They're very well cared for. Our community embraces that and that helps. Recruiting is not easy and it's a constant challenge for police and we lose people. Not because we did anything wrong, it's a tough business to be in, but our police have done a great job of turning over every stone to recruit the best people possible. And I do want to remind you, there is no lowering of standard. You either meet the city of Auburn standards or we do not hire you. That's just, we're not going to hire people to have warm bodies. So they do a great job. So I want to talk about new bid thresholds. We talked about this a little bit during the legislative session, but competitive bids, you know, for there are things, we, we quote things around town, but at the moment, things under $15,000 don't have to be bid. Things over $15,000 do ignore construction projects, put that um, aside. And so the state law has changed as of August 1, it's taken effect that it, that is being raised to $30,000 where we do not have to bid. And I don't, again, don't want you to interpret that a lot of us don't get multiple quotes in these time frames. And on the public works bid law, we used to make it a, a repair to something for $50,000, under $50,000, and we didn't have to bid it. Um, and now they've, they've moved that to 100. It's making some things easier. But again, public works, you know, they will get multiple quotes on things. They work with finance at times about whether or not things have to be bid. And the problem with the $50,000 number is cumulatively, you've seen a number of tree removal contracts. They keep hitting the council agenda. The, cumulative dollar amount of our tree removal on an annual on a monthly basis exceeds minimum amounts so that's why you see small contracts showing up because and the university is very excellent at this cumulatively depending on what you're spending it can cause you to cross a bid threshold so all that to say i am going to be asking you as i've mentioned before in the budget ordinance to raise my spending limit to thirty thousand dollars where it's not having to come to the city council 
Now, that doesn't mean on the bid side, if we're exceeding some sort of bid side of things that we don't have to come to you, but it does mean uh, the spending authority of the city manager has been 15 grand for a very long 2009. Yeah. So, and this, this would tie back to, it could be adjusted if state law, the consumer price index could similarly be adjusted. That'll be at the very end of the budget ordinance. And so we'd be happy to talk about that, but I'm signaling that that is, I want it out there because I want you to know what it is. It resides in a financial policy right now that you don't really see. And I want to put it front and center in front of you. So everybody's clear every time we're adopting a budget ordinance, it's right there for you to see. All right. 2023 significant changes. I'll go through these pretty quickly because some of them I'm going to come back to. We added 2 million to resurfacing in 2023, but that's really carry over or carry forward from uh, 2022. I'll get, we're going to do a whole thing on resurfacing and we actually have some gigantic drawings for you if you want to take them that will show you where we're resurfacing for the next two years. Allison talked about the $1.4 million pass through for it's Indian Pines now called Pines Crossing and that's just purchase of the land from Auburn University where that was reinvested directly back into the project. So it shows up as a significant change in the budget. Um, the, the million dollars in the increase in appropriation, that's the sales tax, the 1.25% of our local 4%. Every time our revenue projections adjust up, so does this number. And we talked a little bit in your pre-budget workshop about the fact that we true up with the schools at the end of the year. We do equal monthly payments based on projections and sometimes they owe us money, but lately it's been us owing them money. Uh, but that's how we do that. There's $590,000 for unbudgeted payouts to staff for annual and sick leave. As people retire or have certain privileges in the management level, they can cash out sick leave and or most of the folks that could cash out sick leave. Becky is one of them and I'm not here to, to pick on Becky, but there was a time that city employees could cash a portion of their sick leave out that those rules have changed. We have very few employees in that realm, but um, employees are welcome as they leave to cash out their annual leave or their vacation time. And so and that we don't project leave. that at all? It's hard to project because we don't know who's going to cash out when. Is that a placeholder? Exactly a good question. And it's something that we've already talked about. And you'll see that in the next budget because that's exactly what, what I've said is we need to try to project some sort of placeholder number. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, we don't, there's, don't disagree. It's a great question, and it's something that we already have talked about adjusting as a team because it's, it's happening. I'll tell you, we have a long-tenured staff, so some of these things happen. And some staff members have drawn down over multiple years, so it, it just depends on who does what. So, um, and Kristen will remind me, you can't ask people, hey, are you retiring in six months? I need to, I need to budget for that. So... We're going to look at longevity of folks and try to and look at how much we have been expending and try to come with a plug number that at least makes this adjustment a little bit lower. Um, I'm, you'd think it's odd that I'd be proud of this one, but $572,476 in, in personal services adjustments. We did a compensation and class study, and it told us some of our folks were Need, their pay needed to be adjusted. Some people did not see a change, but particularly in our crews, our people that are out on the front line every day, you know, mowing, they're fixing the streets, they're water and sewer, they're heavy equipment operators. Uh, the biggest jumps we had were in our crew level positions, correct, Kristen? Yes, Stephen, that's what, no, do you have something else to add to that? Did I miss something? Okay. So in our crew level positions, among others, so across the board, um, that is a big retention and recruitment thing. We need to be competitive in the marketplace. What percentile do we shoot for? Thank you. So we're not trying to be the highest paying folks. Um, but we're also, um, some of you have asked me about the University of Alabama and what it's paying police officers, which is off the charts. Is that a fair statement, Cedric? Higher than we've ever seen? And they're in the $70,000 range for starting-ish? Ish, yeah, um, mid 60s to uh, low 70s. And so there's some anomalies out there that start throwing off things that you're doing. We're constantly evaluating this. Kristen stays on it, the department heads do, so we're very careful. Um, you see the $235,000 increase for cost of electricity. This is everything across facilities. The more traffic signals we put in, they cost us money. You know, Alabama Power does not give us any of that for free. None of our street lights, anything. So the more neighborhoods we light up, the more pedestrian lights. Um, I imagine that number 
will adjust up. This is our, our best guess based on, you know, Katrina added it for environmental services, Dan did. Based on their current square footage and less efficient buildings, they've, they've tried to project what it's going to cost. So all of this is wrapped into that number. Um, then we did, had $165,000 transfer to the Liability Risk Retention Fund, and Allison's going to remind me that that is a recommendation for a fund balance. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, so we have a fund balance goal that we want to be based on something and not just made up for that fund. Not, not that we make things up. We don't make things up. But we want it to be based on something, and that comes from the state workers' comp kind of reserve level where they t we have to demonstrate to them that we have a certain mm -hmm. level of reserve. So we're going to make that match now. And so that fund balance goal, I think, is around seven hundred thousand and so this brings us to that for the end of 22 and then we'll going forward we'll be we'll be good there we're self-insured so it's important that our reserve mm -hmm. is there because we pay our own claims and that kind of thing so thank you and then the hundred fifty thousand dollars for the portable traffic signals you approve those on one of the council agenda items so in 2024 we're going to talk about this when we get to the capital improvement plan i've added four point million uh, 4.0 million dollars for athletic facilities LED lighting conversion. We could have done this over four years or two years or what have you, but we'll get into that in a minute why I'm recommending all now. Um, I would also prefer we not run out of the light bulbs that are illegal to have over time and no longer manufactured. So we're on a little bit of a ticking clock. Um, I've added, uh, based on revenue projections and so on. I've added another 2.5 million for resurfacing. We'll, again, we'll talk about resurfacing. We're 5 million in 23 and 5.5 in 24, and that's why we're gonna give you, I mean, it's a massive list of streets we're trying to get caught up on some things. 1.8 million, you, or sorry, 2.4 million for Ann Pearson Park. I'll present that in a minute. 1.8 million, you already approved um, in the Public Safety Training Center classroom project. That was just increased costs with design and and size of facility and so on. And none of that's borrowed. No, that's cash. That's not in a plan borrowing. 1.3 million to Auburn City Schools, same thing in, in fiscal 23 based on our revenue projections. You saw on your budget 525,000 for 10 additional police patrol SUVs having both to do with increase in personnel and also we have to have our school resource officers they're not getting the new vehicles but they have to have a vehicle on site and and chief anderson and 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 public safety director matthews have made a deal that the schools are going to offset some costs and some aspects of our vehicles but also it's nearly impossible to get vehicles but we're going to try uh, five hundred twenty-three thousand dollars for the public safety training center burn building i moved this up from fiscal year 26 if we were going to do it in 26 i'm looking for projects that we need to do that we could deliver immediately and and this is something that we don't have to wait on design for they can order a package system chief, chief langford's ready to go and it was important to me that we deliver this in this fiscal year and then uh, back to three hundred sixty thousand dollar transfer to the employee benefit self-insurance fund same fund balance okay. All right, continuing on, a boom mower doesn't sound exciting to you. Dan is very excited about it. It mows hillsides and does all kinds of things. And this would be our second boom mower, is that correct? And then a lot of you do hear from your constituents. We're adding a street sweeper to the fleet, which will help in our busiest months. And then if we have downed equipment, it helps us keep up. But overall, Dan has been reporting to me the street sweepers themselves have been working fine. Yes. So I'm in the street sweeper We have three currently. So you said it's at three. Yeah. Correct. Well, we have two operators that operate those three sweepers pretty much daily. Uh, and this is a backup unit which we need when one of the units down for servicing or whatever. It does give us the ability to put a third operator out there though if we want to with newer equipment. So and in our busiest time that is something that's under consideration. Um, I hear from a lot of you and your constituents right in a three or four month period where they expect us to be out there every day. So we're trying to respond to that. Um, same in, oh, sorry, re-roofing at Dean Road Rec Center has to do with, uh, if you'll remember, we put air conditioning in, in Frank Brown and in Boykin Gymnasiums and Dean Road was lagging behind. That's rescue plan money for the air conditioning. But in order to facilitate this at Dean Road, it can't handle it without a brand spanking new roof. So we've had to add a $275,000 cost for that. Those who vote in those and use those facilities will be deeply grateful about the air conditioning. Did I miss anything, Becky? That's right? OK. So then um, electricity costs, again, same thing. 
uh, the $200,000 for planning and zoning ordinance update and revision. This is on the heels of the plan unit development language we're working on. I've talked with a lot of you individually about need for change um, in the zoning ordinance and continued modification. When you saw the interstate commercial district out on Cox Road that kind of came in, we have to add more zones. We need to simplify our zoning ordinance. It doesn't mean we're going to make it easier for people. It means our citizens can't even understand our zoning ordinance, let alone it's hard developers, staff, new staff members, and we need to revamp some things. I don't want you to take it that we're making it easier, that we're taking neighborhood conservation away, that we're doing any of those things. Um, when you try to do something in our zoning ordinance, and I am the longest tenured planner at the city, you got to flip to 48 different pages at times, it seems, this section to that section. And this is hiring a consulting firm to simplify and continue to give you more certainty. You ultimately hold the keys to this as to what's going where. Um, and you're going to hire, you're going to farm that out. Yeah, we've solve. got to farm that out. Mm -hmm. So we can stop doing development review completely and shut it down and do the zoning ordinance, but the staff does not have the capacity to do this themselves. And so if the council would prefer that we not do this, we don't have to do it. Um, the reason we're recommending this is the feedback that we've gotten. I've gotten a lot, I've sat in a lot of meetings where people who are users of the zoning ordinance are asking for it, but we don't have the staff capacity with current development review. I've got a principal planner position open that we're not getting bites on. We're, st we're still not filled on the planning director position. We've had a very hard time finding planners in general, so I don't believe that we can serve the citizens of Auburn and development that's going on and have the capacity to revamp the zoning ordinance at the same time. Staff still has to manage it. How many staff, if we were to have staff to do a plan like this or to work on an update and a revision, how many staff would be required to do that? That really just depends on the final scope of this, Scott. I mean, to do this for that time period. That's why this is a come and go. We can handle the administration of it, but a full, a lot of rewrite of this takes in a consulting firm. Which would probably equate to more than $200,000 in Absolutely. salary benefits, insurance. Absolutely. And, and take away from our To program. me, this is one of the most important initiatives we can make. I mean, this is where a lot of discussion and debate and misunderstanding occurs that we all receive those calls and emails from. And the cleaner we can make this, the better. And if this helps us do it more efficiently, then <clears throat> I'm certainly open to it. Well, I was saying, I started here, the zoning ordinance is about this thick. We have really relatively the same amount of zones. We've tweaked a few things, and it's now about this thick. And that is one of the challenges it's hard to understand we will be bringing a new planning director on who will have a strong lens on this and this is this is a good thing um, performance zoning one of our challenges is it was fine for 1984 it is not fine for 2023 in, in its current format and it confusion among our citizens about and i'm not advocating taking away the comprehensive development district but it it allows cdd zoning everything from very low density large lot residential to light manufacturing and all uses in between. When something is zoned, and so I'm going to take Richland and Shig Jordan Parkway as an example, CDD, and there's houses that back up to it. People are furious about the current attempt to develop there. Well, what they didn't know is they, apparently they were buying a house abutting a piece of property that was zoned to do just about anything you want, and a lot of it's permitted by right. And so my goal here, too, is to give our citizens some certainty as to what might go there and make it a little more prescriptive. Kevin, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. When's the last time we really did a full zoning dive like this? We used to do a triennial review, and we cut those, golly, in the 90s and early 2000s we did, and we cut, we do every three years a deep dive into the zoning ordinance but that was just kind of revamping zones and a little less land use plan we've never in my 26 years here never done quite this so what i mean the, the zoning we're using now is was written when in the 70s 80s it was written when our population would have been 20 22,000 people tommy would remember there was a lot of consternation over the zoning <laughs> ordinance no he would remember as a staff member there was a lot of fights, and Philip's not here. Becky was here at the time, too. There were a lot of nasty fights over, over this zoning ordinance. A gentleman named Kendig, who I would run over with my vehicle, probably, if I saw him, had this notion that all uses could coexist as a function of landscaping and setbacks and buffering. 
That is really what this was built around. And the, the idea wasn't bad in the 80s, but we're also, say we were 20,000 people, now we're 80,000 people, and it's probably not quite working. And one thing that continues to resonate with me is everybody says, not in my backyard, because they didn't realize what could go there. And by right, say at Richland and Shug, somebody can build a shopping center right now, right at, right at their back doors, because that is what the zoning allows. But again, to reiterate, I'm not trying to take away a comprehensive development district from the people who have it. That's not it, but I, we will be moving toward not creating additional zones that are that broad because it'll challenge people. Yes? What did we just vote on PUD? It's plan unit development regulation, which is a very specific, and Kevin, do you want to just give a one minute overview? So, so the PUD regulations, which we are working again with the consultant right now to kind of develop those, and we'll have a big update for city manager and council and also the planning commission probably a little bit later on this fall essentially is um, kind of an opportunity to, for the development community to come up with, I'll say, some more creative solutions. We see a lot of creative solutions that are, um, I think, in some cases, superior to what our current zoning allows. I mean, we, we sat down with somebody yesterday and, you know, they wanted to do a certain residential product type and, you know, you try and fit it into the box of our zoning and it basically steers you in the direction that isn't ultimately the best outcome you know as far as aesthetics and something that fits in the community so this will allow um, you know property owners developers to come forward and propose different sorts of things from a development standpoint however there are trade-offs in that as far as you know maybe additional landscaping aesthetics um, setbacks those sorts of things so it's really kind of a, a little bit of a customized zoning so to speak for every project that would come forward. Now, of course, we're, we've got to develop certain standards for that, you know, kind of a menu, so to speak, of what those trade-offs would be, and that's something that um, obviously will require a, a, a lot of detail, and that's something we're really digging Say you're doing into. a 200-acre project, they might be willing to give us 20 acres for a park as part of, while well, we can't require it by state law for consideration for what they're doing, they may be able to give us park property. And it's a contract between the city council Planning Commission makes a recommendation and then they can either follow the rules of the zoning ordinance as written or they can ask you to do different things. The public should get something in return. Everybody's supposed to win with this and if it doesn't get past the governing body, it doesn't happen. They have no rights in a PUD and you have no legal obligation to approve one. So that's, that's the good news, you get to decide. Um, but this is a way too that we've had some problems even with large developments that could have been addressed if we had flexibility put in your hands and you are the ultimate arbiters. So we'll talk more about that um, when a contract comes up. $135,000 for a police drone. Um, the police drone was conditional capital. Um, the drone itself is a little less than this, but there's other equipment that goes with it. This thing goes 80 miles an hour. Can It can follow a car pretty fast and some other things. We're not into high-speed chases, correct, Chief? They're pretty rare. It's not our protocol. It's not. Um, and it, it can't fly 80 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I remembered something correctly. Um, so it's a big deal. You know, the, the other thing is our current flight time, 50, 30, 30, minutes 30 minutes before we have to land a drone. We use this in heavily wooded areas. We also use it to find people. Um, we use it in different EMS situations and, and lost kids and all kinds of things that we can fires, do. Uh, fires for hot spots in the river line. This has the ability, and we didn't put this in the budget. I didn't last year. We hadn't, we hadn't finished vetting it between information technology, police, and we needed some more information. We've got that, um, and my goal is to be able to maximize efficiency with the equipment and get this stuff in the air. And it also can keep our people from getting hurt. And so that's another very important so thing. So this will be an additional drone? Or? Yeah, additional to those. I don't know how much we'll use those afterward, either of you. The we'll, existing we'll still one. continue to use the ones that we have. Uh, the, the one that we're, we're uh, anticipating to purchasing, uh, it will, like I say, fly for close to three hours. When we bring it down to, to change the batteries out, we will launch one of the ones that we, we currently mm -hmm. have. And we will also keep those in the, in the uh, patrol units in case we need them uh, while they're out patrol. And they're used these frequently, drones, yeah. yeah. Even down to, um, Councilwoman Witten's been asking me about um, 
Woodland Pines Elementary traffic, it's in her ward, and we deploy those for even in school zones. We, we use it to monitor because we can see Donahue and Farmville and how far the stack is going. We can get them high enough. So they, we use drones in many of our departments to do many things, but these are public safety specific. But we do drone share when needed. It's needed for another city purpose, and we also do that. So, and then last, um, there was a search and rescue maze that kind of had been in the budget, but this is, this is a little different and kind of hybridizing some things. So this is a bump up to complete out, minus what is the one last thing we have, Chief Langford, that is not in the budget yet? Do you remember or will? There's one other piece of equipment we have yet to do, and it's a, it's a big chunk of change. And I, well, we the, drafting pit the drafting pit is in here. There's um, one other thing left that is not. Yeah, the flashover simulator, and that is the that's the one last piece that is not in this current current budget. So, real quickly, capital improvement plan. You're familiar with the public safety training center classroom building. We've already gone through city council for that, but this is where we want to talk about. There's a search and rescue maze. I just told you the dollar amount, but that gives you a little bit of how that works. And I'm sure all this equipment will be very interesting once installed. Um, also, this PowerPoint. I will email you once we downsize the file, you'll be able to download it um, for you. I'll get that to you tomorrow. Then we've also got, this is what a burn building looks like. Uh, again, these are package units that come and then they're able to do training there. And then we've also got the drafting pit where you know they pull water and can do all kinds of interesting things. They can also, you can also climb down in there. Is that correct, John? I hope so for uh, confined space training. Yep. So then on traffic and transportation, a few things. The annual resurfacing and restriping, that's five million right now. And that's coming two million from previous fiscal year. And then in FY24, 5.5, don't try to look hard at this next thing because you're gonna get a more detailed printout that is large. Um, this is in FY23, that's just the list of, that's the list of streets, but there's different sections that are being done. You've got, you've got the map on the right and it's actually got the locations numbered with the streets associated with them. We're, we're gonna give you your own version to look over. So you don't have to sit here and focus too much on it, but it's, this is meant to show you it's all over town and it's a massive amount of streets and sections, um, what we're working on. And the same in fiscal 24, I added, we were at 3 million flat both years. I added more money. We're trying to get caught up. If we don't catch up on some of these things, our roads will degrade. Um, DNJ actually does better with the larger the contract. They, we get more movement out of them. And you'll also see there's neighborhood streets and then there's major streets like Bank Creek, like North Donahue, like there's, there's much. Allison, do you have anything to add or Dan? Thank you for the Huh? Thank you for <laughs> well, you got to thank them. They approve it. But again, we'll hand out to you anybody that wants one. It's, a, it's about a, this size of sheet for each year, so you have something you can look at. Um, and we'll send you a PDF if you want to zoom in on, but those are, those are easier. So, Anna Luniche University Drive, you knew about this, but this is, has bumped to a start date immediately of September 5th. It is finally moving. It's going to be a little busy in that area because DNJ will also be moving a lot of dirt in that area for the airport runway extension. So put your seat belts on. They will not be out on East University Drive, but they certainly will on Sagahatchee Road. Um, and this is adding turn lanes finally at Antelou and uh, uh, our Ward 4 representative, Councilman <laughs> Adams, has been dealing with some spicy people about the lack of a turn lane in a certain area that we have cut off. So. And that's on the Sagahatchee Road up here. You're not going to be able to turn left in or out. It's right in, right out. We had a lot of bad accidents there. We actually have a person in this room who's had an accident there, at least one that I know of. Um, and so we'll be glad to get that moving. Uh, North Dean and East University Drive is also slightly delayed and is now happening. That's gets you double left turn lanes. Allison, just on North Dean Road or, yeah, North Dean Road right at the car wash. Uh, between the car wash and the gas station here, so we have to do some widening. So it will be double left, one straight, and now one right. Initially, we didn't think we were, we thought we'd do a straight right, and now we're actually, it'll be a four lane section right there. That's about to get going also with that. That has been a signal pole issue also. It is. Okay. So, and then we talked about this as the last council meeting, but I want to remind you about the gay Drake and college and Drake, and that is. That is left turn lanes on College and Drake. 
at the College Drake intersection. That is a sidewalk on the south side as several of you, Councilman Griswold and Councilman Witten, have been asking for for a very long period of time as your wards have crossed there. Um, and then that is the roundabout as we have discussed at, at Gay and Drake. And that has been in the works for a very long time. City Engineer? Correct. Yes. And how far along are we on design? We are in the very early stage. Okay. And I'll acknowledge some right of way is going to be needed from one, one parcel where the Drake House is. It's not going to impact the uh, building itself. It sits way back, but a little bit of property will be needed to facilitate that. Um, so is there going to be a um, roundabout on Drake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there's a roundabout. This is the Gay Drake intersection. This will be a roundabout. And then also this is the boulevard had paid into a sidewalk fund and that will complete the sidewalk from here up to our development up further up North Gay. We'll do that as part of this project, but they paid for it. It's just going in this project. So and, and there's also going to be a roundabout on the college and Drake. No ma'am, just left turn lanes. Oh, just will that be left turn arrows? Correct. Yeah. So you have protected, um, Councilman Parsons would notice that, that Gay and, and Sanford finally got their turn arrows, those finally are functional. Um, and that's a big deal and it's the same, very, very needed here. It will help traffic move. Oh, I, I think I got a little confused being as a city council meeting. I, I, I was thinking that the, the um, yeah, yeah. roundabout was going to be. No ma'am, at the, at the strange intersection at Gay and Drake, okay. the one that is hard to know if somebody's coming at you, that one. Have we studied Shelton and North College for left turn signals? Yes. Is that what was the? I think it's in the fiscal plan we already, but we're working on design. Okay. All right. And last, Parks and Recreation and Cultural Master Plan. I'm going to skip through a few projects because Boykin comes at the very end. So just um, reminder: we're under construction with Lake Wilmore. The only thing, and you can't see very well on. Oop, that's not going to do what I want it to do. On the way northern section, there's pickleball courts up in this general vicinity. The only thing I want to mention to you when we get to the fields project, which is next, and you, you oops, sorry, you can't see it on there, but right now we're only slated for six, is that correct? And we, we will likely be doing tw 12 and possibly 18, either as, depending on state law we may be able to add it to the current project or we'll add it to the fields project the reason I say that you're being pushed about pickleball and this will be covered completely whatever we do so we have right now our current six courts were slated to be lit um, without a cover and we may change order out the lighting and then do the superstructure so we're looking at the different layouts to see staff is still working on that but it will be covered and I'm not here to copy Opelika but it will be similar to Opelika in terms of ability to play and with the sides that come down enough that you don't get totally wet in a rain event. So we're hoping um, that that doesn't uh, create more consternation at it than it needs to, but it is still way far from residents. Different residences, it's no different. You know, I didn't, if the pickleball people get unruly, then, you know, Max, you have to deal with it. So just a reminder, we're still on track for the fields project and to be out to bid very soon with the six multi-purpose or four multi-purpose fields that we talked about um, that will not be captive to any one sport, but will be used for flag football, a little bit of soccer, lacrosse, and then baseball practice and softball practice in the spring. So that's, that's ongoing. And then this lighting conversion, the, the metal halide light, lighting at the athletic fields has to go and the, the, the lights that uh, have to be replaced with all LED and so those are going we have a limited ability to get supply of light bulbs and why our staff moved mountains and molehills thought they could get a, at least a two-year supply then we have to have a building to store all the light bulbs in and it became this exponential thing and so we have to do this in the next two to four years anyway so I felt strongly I mean, it's affordable right now to rip off the band-aid and just get this done because we've got to convert everything to LED. Keith, Becky, missing anything on that that you wanted to add? So you can see here, softball complex, Marjorie Piper Bailey Field, Sanford Tennis Center, the soccer complex. Some of them have LED, some do not. Um, so seven fields there, the Shug Field, Duck Sanford, Yarbrough, Clay Tennis Courts, and Felton Little Park. That's a lot of lights. It's probably impossible to project, but the savings 
cost of electricity was? Yeah, I don't think we know yet, do we? Yeah, Musco, you'll see that when it comes to the council agenda. We'll be able to tell you a little bit more about that if you approve this year. All right, and Pearson Park. So a little bit about this project. It was a little over a year ago that the Auburn University Foundation approached me to say, hey, would the city be interested? If any of you are familiar with Noble Hall and Ann Pearson, she left property. Ultimately, it went to Auburn University um, and you know, has done many wonderful things for the city and has been a very giving person. But to orient you, this is East University Drive and going up Shelton Mill Road, Noble Hall sits over here. This is, you'll see pasture land on your right, there's a clearing. I'll get you better renderings of it in the, in the future slides. But um, we have a wonderful opportunity here. So what happened is the Auburn University Real Estate Foundation Incorporated approached us and said, first it was, hey, what would you think about buying some of this property? And I looked at that realistically saying, I talked with Becky, we have no property outside of Shig Jordan Parkway. Um, in this vicinity, we do out Richland Road for a park. We have Hickory Dickory that's just inside. We've got nothing. That changed um, with some generous folks, and we'll be more ready to talk about that when this gets a little further. Um, where some land swapping went around, the, the Carters, Colin Carter of Carter and Carter Construction, purchased a parcel to the north for his homestead of this, and this ended up being a parcel available. The foundation has been extremely generous along with a generous donor who I'll name later, who turned around and, and financially there was a nice transaction that allowed, this is all uh, Georgia Alabama Land Trust property or Alabama Georgia Land Trust property, allowed a purchase to help facilitate some money the foundation needed that also would allow the city to lease this property. We don't have the final term of years, it'll be 30 plus for $10 a year, 47 acres of property for $10 a year. I can't buy 47 acres of property without a hundred plus thousand dollars an acre in a vicinity like this or more. So this was a wonderful opportunity. Um, under the Georgia Alabama Land Trust, a passive park would be allowed. And, and Ms. Pearson, way in the early 2000s, put this, or Dr. Pearson, in, in the land trust to keep the property from being developed aspects of it. And so this piece, falls under the auspices of that. Um, and like I said, we don't have a final lease term, but it's the nominal fee in the current draft of the lease is $10 a year. I can't be clear that this is the Auburn University Real Estate Foundation Incorporated, not the university itself. It's their real estate foundation, separate group related to, but separate from. Um, so we are on the hook, if we do this, to build a two point Oh, well, a $2.4 million park it includes some turn lanes on Shelton Road. That was their only asset, actually, like a roundabout at this location. Not going to be possible anytime soon. Um, and I'll get into a little more about what do I mean. If you're looking at this property, these are pictures on Shelton Road. You can see there's a pasture land, and you'll see like a small little tiny, tiny barn out there. And it's heavily wooded. You can see how heavily wooded it is. Um, this is what we're proposing to do. This is a passive park. That's the only thing we're allowed to do. Um, we'll have reasonably sized parking lot. It's allowed to be lit. We'll have um, a pavilion and restroom facilities. We'll have a big, the darker trail you see uh, is a gigantic one mile loop. Um, we'll have another small pavilion down here, um, up in this area. And again, I'll be happy to give you where you can see better. Small playground area. And um, we also have a, ADA trail that goes around so there'll be a hard surface for people who need accessibility. They, they have a smaller loop that they can walk on. And then this big open space here, we're not allowed to have organized play, but nothing keeps families from going out there and playing a small soccer game together or whatever they want to do. We just can't have fully active, energized athletics in competition format there. So it doesn't mean you can't run around and, and go crazy. It just means we shouldn't have an organized event there. And so ultimately, to give you an idea, it kind of similar to Denius would have more natural looking um, buildings and so on that blend in. The Georgia Alabama Land Trust has approval rights, not architecturally. They have to give us the stamp of approval on our final plans. They've already reviewed this conceptual plan and agree with it. So what we're really faced with here is um, yep, a two, oops, sorry, a two point 
four million dollar park. The other thing that you see on, in one last phase would be disc golf. That's the only thing we're not funding right now. And disc golf is also allowable per the land trust. Um, that's probably less than half a million dollars and I'm just recommending to fund that in a, in a future phase should we want to do that. Um, so it would be $2.4 million for a park we never thought we could have. This is not in the Parks and Recreation Cultural Master Plan because we didn't control any property in this area. However, in June, I met with, with Becky and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and they resoundingly supported this proposal to move forward. And their only caveat was, if you spend $2.4 million here, you're not gonna take money from Boykin or Lake Wilmore you know, please don't do that. And the answer was, no, 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 this is a separate project. So you have any questions about this? I think it's important to, uh, to everybody to know that the Real Estate Foundation, as well as the donor, made a request that we move as mm -hmm. fast as we could yes. in a reasonable frame of time right. to get this project done. That was their yeah. request of, of the city. So we have a design contract that is ready to go on the council agenda, but I've been unwilling to move it forward until we presented it to you as a group, and I got questions answered before, but it will appear on the next council agenda, which would coincide with the first night of the budget of the design contract I need to get moving because one of the donors is also in jest said, hey, I'm not getting any younger. Can you please get this built? And so, Allison, Fraser, it's not a lengthy build. This isn't a complicated project because we're not clearing, the only thing we're clearing is for the trails and the parking lot. It will be easy to get contractors for this, and then you've got restrooms and some playground equipment and a couple pavilions. So it's not a extremely complicated project. So we're comfortable that we can get this done next fiscal year. How many parks are on the north side of town? How many, that many parks that are there? How many parks do we have on the north side of town? None. None. Hickory None. Dickory is the closest. Hickory Dickory. Yeah. yeah. Nothing um, that's passive, right? No. no. How, how big is Kiesel Park? Eight acres. Eight acres. So this would be a smaller mm -hmm. Kiso without mm -hmm. water features and whatnot. Yeah. I'm trying to get the lease term longer than 30 years, but I, I will not look a gift horse in the mouth if the foundation stays staunch at, at 30 years, even for a $2.4 million investment. We're, we're more than depreciated and way on out, and I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. This is not something we were expecting at all. Um, but I don't know where else we can get 47 acres of property. You, use of it for $10 a year, and that is viable for our citizens, this is. Well, and we're often um, asked about preserving land within the city, and this is, a, I think, a, a unique opportunity for us to signal that we want to, to participate in the preservation of the vision that Dr. Pearson had for this land on that side of town. So, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable that we've been presented this opportunity, and I think it um, all points positive for, for the city. Their one caveat also is that it be named Ann Pearson Park, and you know, why that is ultimately up to you, that is part of the agreement. So if we agree to the ground lease for this, then we're agreeing to that, and I didn't see any issues with proposing that to you. Um, so I felt it was a fair request. So. There's no reason to think that in 30 years, <coughs> They won't extend the lease. Yeah, there, all those provisions will be in there. You'll see a lease. We're not ready to go with the lease document, but this is the first step. I told them I want to make sure before we then move forward. I mean, we're in the comment phase between attorneys. The comments to the lease are pretty minor, and I would move the lease forward pretty quickly if they're ready for your approval. You'll see the whole document along with a memo explaining things. You, um, you don't know of any reason. No, okay. no, and, and because the, you know, there's also, you'll see the attachments to the lease. There's also the easement agreement for the conservation easement. All that is in there. So you'll, you'll see, there's specific things that say you can only do one acre for parking lot restrooms and so on. I mean, we vetted all of this. This has been going on for over a year. Um, it's been extremely generous. And the nice thing is everybody's come to the table excited about a project. Like this has been a great collaboration. Yes, sir. I, I agree. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, we need it in North, North Auburn. It's just disappointing that it's been going on for, like you said, over a year. The first time the council as a whole hears about it is at the budget presentation. You know, the council as a whole should have been at least advised or informed of what's going on. But that's the way it goes. Weren't some of those conversations at the direction of the Real Estate Foundation? 
Yeah, initially we were asked to, to keep this confidential. And I didn't, one of the things, and the reason I didn't tell the entire council about it from my lens is until I saw that ground lease and knew it was doable, it, I don't want to propose something to you very publicly that then is going to not come to fruition. I am at a point that I believe that this can move forward, that the document is there, it's present. So um, protocol-wise, that's up to you guys. If you want to instruct me as a body differently to do things differently, I'll gladly do that. So any other questions on Pearson Park? All right. Boyk and Donahue campus, this is just a big slide kind of showing, you know, the overall project budget of $32 million. You're going to get a lot more detail. This is just a breakdown. And again, this is... For reference, you're getting this PowerPoint in your packets. We're about to present all of this to you, the greater staff that's dealing with it. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And then I just want to summarize about mid biennium in general. You know, any expenditures carried forward also had funds carried forward to pay those items. That's normal. You know, we had 7.3 million unspent in fiscal 22. We talked about that, you know, and it, which was available in fiscal 23. Um, our revenues in 22 were higher than expected. And now 23 and 24 are the same. You're seeing that shift through. You're also seeing major shifts in the CIP. Um, I think the keys here are we keep the net ending fund balance above 20, 25%. And you can see in the original and proposed kind of where we are. The majority of our proposed adjustments in both fiscal years are related to increased capital investment. Um, it tied back to plans in that, you know, we want to make sure we keep our longstanding tradition of fiscal system sustainability um, yeah 44% number what if you net out carry forward stuff what's that true number do we know in the net out carry forward what that true number is we can get that yeah okay. give us we'll get that to you just, just curious if it's sure. in line with the 30% or I mean, we're just sitting pretty heavy so. yeah we've been carrying forward for a very long time many years so it, it compounds uh, but what, what I like to get back to is every time we hit the reset button, every time we adjust the budget. So we're in a reset phase as we go into fiscal 24, we kind of reset that and we're, we're constantly carrying forward, but we're rebudgeting. So, yes. And Megan, um, all these numbers mm -hmm. reflect what has been uh, proposed to presented. You. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And then last, the, you know, we talked about any fund balance, you know, as you know, Allison talked about being conservative. We're just not going to willy nilly go out there and over overshoot revenue. We just don't do that. And even though she signaled many times, it's likely to be higher. We still don't know what will happen. We don't have our crystal ball. So our crystal ball has always been very conservative. So we're going to be careful. And then we do have a six year CIP. So you'll see other things leading out. One of our challenges with the six year outlook is that revenues stay conservative throughout that. So more projects will pop on um, over time. You'll see new projects proposed for next, you know, well, by the time we get to this next summer. But we're trying to give you a snapshot of things we're thinking of doing. It's really to let you know what's out there and what we plan to do as we know it today. All right. Do you have any other questions for this piece? We'll jump to Boykin and then we can wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> Bond. I know the paper losses. But we don't. We don't. We have a significant bond portfolio that we had to write down. The only thing that we have to stand on our treasuries and agencies. Okay. Well, that's it. I mean, not bonds, but not treasuries. Yeah. yeah. And so we always hold those to maturity. So what we did see when rate when rates shoot way up, the inverse relationship to the price of bonds. And so we did have a pretty significant paper loss. Right. And just 
I'll add to, um, I don't know if you know that the SAFE board in the state of Alabama is our, is what secures our investments. And that's all the banks in the state of Alabama that want to participate in that. They have pledged securities to, that, that makes our money safe. Anything above the FDIC insurance is secured by that SAFE board bond. Right. Before we get yeah, into this, sure. I have specific questions. You want to hold up to the end? You mind with Steve Boykin, and we'll be happy to come okay, back. Okay, yeah, what on the deals with Boykin, so go ahead. Okay, we'll see if we answer that or not. Go ahead, Allison. All right, good afternoon. I want to give you a quick update. It's loud as you can, Allison. Yeah, yeah, grab that other microphone. This one. that is contingent upon the generator coming for the new environmental services building. Right now it's scheduled to be in production at the end of September, so hopefully by early October the generator is installed and our staff can begin moving. Once we start moving, we'll be able to schedule the bid for this project. The first phase of the project, um, this is our current site plan. The project does include walking trails, uh, lighting along North Donahue, as well as along the trails relocation of the recycling center, the site preparation for, if you guys remember, the future rec center and pool, as well as um, a play area and, like I said, the library. Uh, you've got the cost up there for those items. Those items are also included in your CI. Yeah, you want to go back up the walking trails? Oops. Go back and I'll tell this. Yeah. We will have walking trails that connect from North Donahue over to the existing Boykin facility. I think it was at the last meeting you approved a mitigation, um, a contract to the mitigation bank. That's that field where the mouse is there. So there will be a trail going around that field to the Boykin side. And they point out the library here. There's a library, Boykin Center, Boykin Center. He's recited the gymnasium and swimming pool. Yes. And yes. Okay, so when you say swimming pool, are you talking about this black play or? Splash pad is now. Oh, but a future swimming pool. Is yeah, it? this is future swimming pool. Okay, so where's the splash pad? Splash pad is right here. Yeah. Right here. There. Yeah. And we'll go through each of the elements of. You're going to see it's just in of This is just showing you yep. orient you to the site. So remember from the original site plan that was the rec center and pool location. So the rec center has been removed. Okay. Recycling is free. So we're excited about a new recycling center that we'll be able to have. It's more like a convenience center. Right now we have <coughs> recycling drop uh, boxes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the recycling center is going to be more of a convenience center because of the location, the access. Um, so we'll have new bins. Um, we'll also have two accessible bins that are a little lower, a little smaller um, for anyone. Um, that is uh, a little handicapped disabled. And, uh, okay, you just look there. There it is. And so, what she's showing you there are our new bands that are back uh, in the back. That doesn't work on the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we've got 10 new bands that are coming in to house all of our aluminum cans, um, cardboard, um, all the things that you see. Uh, that we recycle, including our plastics, and then we have a new glass bunker, and that bunker is twice the size of the one that we have now. Um, I see a lot of people that are often out there relieving some stress, I think maybe one of them. <laughs> um, we'll also have a new um, brick facade that's on the front side that looks very pretty. You'll see this slide later on the um, and it will house all of our electronics and they will be a little more secure in that area. Right now we have the Zico. So this is what we have currently. This site has been here since 1999. And I think we owe a great deal of credit to Al Davis sitting in the back for developing it. 
It is the only one in the state that is open 24 hours a day. And so we want to make sure that we keep something like that available to all of our citizens with access. Um, it's used often, it's well lit, and we're keeping that same concept across the street. So this, this site is about an acre, and we're still going to have about an acre across the street, but we'll have more bins. And that's the new rendering there. So you see the brick facade that's on the outside. It looks very nice and blends in with our downtown area. And that's the inside where all the electronics, the batteries, um, computers will be housed in. And this is on dining. Yes, ma'am. That's going to be on dining. Yes, ma'am. Where the fleet services is today, where you see all the vehicles behind the fenced area, mm -hmm. they'll be moved over there. So across the street from where it is today. Excellent. Patricia, this will still be the only place you can bring glass here, right? That is the only place you can bring glass. We do have a convenience center that is located at the fire department on Ship Jordan, but it's a small trailer um, to help people out. But this is the only place that you can bring glass. We actually accept glass from Auburn University and the city of Oklahoma. Okay. Thank you. So a few notes on the cultural center. Um, you can see that in the slide. It's adjacent to the library. It's about 2,200 square feet. Uh, and this is a project we started working on somewhere around 2019. And it's uh, designed to be a Rosenwald school replica. And it's classrooms, restrooms, storage rooms, and a potential gallery. And that's just a copy of the floor plan. It does mimic a two-room Rosenwald school. Uh, two classrooms, um, we do have um, potential for a gallery there, Rosa Parks Gallery, and the commercial components that we had to add were obviously restrooms, they didn't have those back in the, the day. The Rosa Parks Gallery, if you remember, was a signal Councilman Dawson we had wanted to name something. Oh. Recall that, and so part of this was, and there's always been a front area, but the deal was that this would be a gallery name for Rosa Parks. Just this, like I said, is harkening back to 2019. A lot of this started then, and Mary Anders has already talked about that at a council meeting a little bit where some of those came from. Okay. So just a couple of renderings of the building. We did have to make it ADA accessible, so we'll have some ramps. Again, those are not things that were had back uh, in the original day. And that's just another view of the cultural center. You have questions about the cultural center? So that, um, walkway it'll walk all the way to, over to the library mm -hmm. yes if you're standing there the library is to the left right garden in between and this is closer to donahue the previous conversation at our last house meeting we discussed potential of a partnership with um, other agencies and organizations who might be willing to support the efforts of this cultural center is there not a way that we could provide the space and the plans and, and have a nonprofit group really be the crux of building this and making it what it is so it's a true community cultural center? You can absolutely do so. What's in the base bid package is the site work and then the, the building itself has its own design so that we're able to do that so it can be pulled out where a nonprofit or we use something when we built the veterans monument we use one of our conduit financing authorities the public park and recreation board we actually bid that that project and that's when Posey construction stepped in and said okay you city pay materials and we'll donate our labor and that's how the veterans monument got built they donated their labor what we can't do is give plans out ahead of time to a nonprofit or anyone else if we're going to bid the building. Because if we're going to bid it, we have to maintain the integrity of the bid that nobody had a, a precursor look. This, this is fine, rendering some floor plans, but not the full plans and specs. And so the question that we have is right now in the budget, this is all in the site work plus the $1.6 million for the building. If you want to go in a different direction and you don't have to decide today, my recommendation would be to leave it in the budget as is, and you need to decide before we go out to bid, which would be in the next couple of months, and we can give you warning. But I, I don't want to 
We can also bid as an alternate. We can bid the building as an alternate to see where the dollars and cents really come in before you make that decision. That doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't change the bid, in our right. opinion. That's right. But we don't put it in the overall, same with the library, splash pad, and whatever, as a must. This is, we'll know exactly and capture the cost just for this. So we plan to bid this maybe October, remember? So I hope that they got to As it stands now, though, this is a budgeted item, correct? Right? Yes. yes. Instruction on it is in county board in LA. Yes, and then all the debt numbers you saw, everything that you've seen about Boykin, it's, it's all in. I think the discussion point, as I understood it from your council meeting, was there are some groups that may be interested in contributing, and what, what does that look like? Either sweat equity or dollars or whatever, and that's what we have taken to for dive in. And we can continue to do that, but as proposed to you, this is fully funded in this. All right. I have a Boykin question. Oh, we're still <coughs> Yep. Um, on page 51, we've got the Boykin renovation phase three. What, what's in each, what, what is in phase one, two, and three? What, what are they? I think uh, phase no three. No for phase two anywhere in the book. So, <laughs> so we started Boykin renovation phase one was before the clinic. The phase, phase two in our world is the clinic. Phase three was the completion of the windows around Boykin, finishing the facade, and doing some renovations in the, where the Boys and Girls Club is, is and the gym. So that's phase three for us, and it was something that was in the CIP, and it's been moved out a little bit. So that's probably what you see if you're referencing. Well, yeah, so it's a whole phase. other project. It's not related to this. It's not Boykin Donahue, that's just the Boykin <coughs> Community Center. <coughs> so. Okay, so that I think it's right there. I'm really confused. Yeah, yeah I got really confused on that, but I, um, I it was explained to me that this is this is actually a whole new faith. And yes, it's, yes this is just it's it's working. I guess not not part of the community. community center, center. Correct. We but call this so we call this the working non campus, and we call the other boy. That's just an internal thing, but we had we've had multiple phases of renovations to the community center. What is the two and a half million in FY twenty seven working renovation phase three? What is that? Mr. Davis, is that us? That's the windows. Plus a lot of the lot the building still has a lot of old windows on the drawer land side, on the senior side, just replace those windows. So it's nothing to do with swimming. Nothing to do with swimming. No. It's to, to do some work on the existing thing. From a from a priority perspective, those other things, Becky, are not ready to enter the CFP at this time. Correct? From the, the gymnasium and the pool are not, not bumping up at this time. And remember, what's fun what you're funding right now is adjustments to twenty-three and just fiscal twenty-four. The the four years looking forward is just our best guesstimate about some things. Things ebb and flow based on citizen surveys, recommendations from the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Just like I expect in your tenure on the City Council of Richland Park will move forward. And again, that, that's that's not showing up in here either. That's based on what the Parks and Rec Advisory Board is, is looking at to recommend. Richland Park. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We own 100 acres of property on Richland Road at Richland and Little Beaker Parkway. It's actually a little sliver on the other side of Little Beaker Parkway. Yeah, we're at Parkway. And so, it's in the cultural plan, right? Yeah, it's in the cultural plan, and that is, you know, that's a huge growth area also where we have no parks. And so, Becky. To allow it. Just, so the um, splash pad was a priority because it was prominently mentioned during the master planning process and we have gotten ongoing requests for splash pad since then. So that's why it's a, a, a go now. Yeah, we, we took the design for the pool because it was pretty much completed and transferred it out to Wilmore. Right? That's what we're doing. No, we didn't take that design. Well, yeah. we already had a pool design that was an outdoor pool. We've added a structure okay. to that that will accommodate. It'll be fully enclosed in colder months, and the sides can come off. So we have a plan for a semi 
sealed. Yes, that is that is in the bid, and that is what we're doing, and he so did. What would it take to take that same plan and move it forward so that we could, you know, we had lots and lots of discussions about a pool, particularly with our senior community, that lost their access to so the style of pool so, that they were referring to that also handled therapeutics plus all of that is a fully enclosed natatorium style and we were in the 30 to 50 million dollar range just for the pools themselves, okay. not the rec center. Uh, also, the pool that we're building at Lake Wilmore has a limited number of lanes for lap swim and for training, whereas <coughs> if you did an aquatic center, you would do one with either six or eight lines. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's in a capital stack. We haven't looked at replicating the the Wilmore pool at all. This is we we've, we've been over this in terms of that we were not doing this in this phase. We did this during the biennial budget process because it was way too expensive. And we also cut the gymnasium out because it was way too expensive. Because we're delivering the gymnasium right now at Lake Wilmore. And it doesn't mean it's not bumping back on for this phase of the project. It was library splash pad and cultural center, future phases to follow. Where the aquatic center lands will be up to you guys and and what advisement you take from the Parks and Rec Advisory Board about priorities. We're being pushed really hard on baseball and softball facilities right now. Um, and Lake Wilmore, we need to see how that's functioning and is it meeting that need or not. And I won't have data until we do that. Okay, I'm just confused on when we said void the conservation phase three. I'm sure. hoping, I was hoping that that included at least the preparation for a pool. Because the people are asking me for a pool, we did by the time we have it. Well, we're putting one at Lake Wilmore that is heated and covered and enclosed. So we added money to that budget to try to meet that need. What it doesn't do, and the only thing it doesn't do, is there is a big fight between those who want the pool at one temperature versus those who want it at the other. And I don't remember in the 80 degree range what it is, Becky, but it will be heated, but it's not going to be as warm as some people would like it. Okay, so my question is, okay, so the future pool that you're putting at Boston is basically going to be the same as you're putting at... No, the one of Waken, as we had planned, is going to be bigger and fully enclosed. It would, and there was also a no, more there's, 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 there's a secondary that would be a full bore indoor aquatic center, as Becky was referring to, <coughs> which is a full bore indoor plus therapeutics piece, zero entry and all that, plus an outdoor. Yeah. At Boyd, yeah. and that is what is delayed indefinitely until we determine where the funds would come and what your priorities are for that versus other projects. <coughs> All right. right. Now, oh, we're going back. So, Tyler Witten is out of town, so this is Ashley Brown. If you have uh, Ashley, she's one of our most excellent employees, and she's going to take you through a few things about library at Boyd County. So I'm excited to talk to you about the uh, library at the Boyd County campus. Um, it is in around 21,000 square feet. Um, this is a, a long time request of our community to have a library in this um, in Northwest Auburn. And we're really excited about it. This building is designed to stand the test of time. It features raised access floors. So as technology changes over the years and people in our community need access to different types of technologies, we don't know what they are, we can move this around. So we'll feature lots of open spaces and places for people to be together in, in community. Um, one feature here that you can see is our vestibule area will be able to be a hold pickup area for 24 seven. So you could be able to get in there Anytime it'll model like the Frank Brown uh, Fitness Center. If you have a card and you sign up for access, you can pick up your books uh, any time of day that you, you want to. Um, we can also move on. We'll also feature lots of meeting space. So something that our community really requests a lot at the library is meeting space. We don't have very much at the Thatch location, uh, but what we do have is heavily used. This will add lots of um, smaller meeting rooms to our facilities to offer our community. So, thank you. So you, so you said the library, they, they're going to have uh, hours um, similar to the Arbor Library. They're right. going to have so the same hours. It's, it, it, to begin with, we're going to start with a 40-hour week just to like to phase in staffing, like, like you asked about staffing earlier, so we can, so we can like staff it at that level. And then as, as it grows, we do hope to uh, expand in a different phase to uh, yeah, the 68 service hours that we have at the FAPS location. Yes, ma'am. 
was looking, I was asking if we did have a rendering, I don't know where it went, but uh, we'll, we'll get that inserted for you. It's the same rendering we had last summer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Becky's going to advance her own slides over there. She's high technology. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is the uh, the site of the splash pad. It's located kind of uh, centrally on the lot next to the library, and uh, it will be uh, be I think popular because it is designed in such a way to have amenities that appeal to all age groups. And as you can see, we have some smaller things for smaller children, children with special needs, and um, for older kids. And I think it'll be very popular. And um, we have always had a lot of requests for splash pads, as some of you know. And um, a lot of them came in during the master planning process, and we've had a lot since then. And so we think this is a, a great addition in that area. And uh, also, I did want to mention that the the graded area and the little walking trail area will be something that would be available for people to be able to play and have unofficial play and um, that kind of thing. Any questions? Hey, retirement bed, would you like to be the first person to use this? <laughs> uh, I've got a couple of things we've got coming online that I'd like to be the first one to use them. I'm thinking, so, the, I'm thinking the indoor walking trail at Lake Wilmore. Yeah, there is, um, this will not be, there'll be staff attendant there, but you don't have to have until our risk management overrules us. This time we don't believe a lifeguard there. Uh, but a staff member will be there because you don't have to be able to swim to use this, but we need to keep an eye on people, make sure nobody gets hurt and what have you. But this, it's nice because parents and families can come here and kids can come here and they don't have to know how to swim, but they can get cooled off. Becky has indicated at um, the inclusive playground that the small water features that we have there are cooling people off and are at least helpful. Um, we do not have the intention as much as people would like for us to build a splash pad at Town Creek. I'm not sure that Bob's constituents could handle it. So, <laughs> so we have a few uh, we have a few water issues that we have to deal with at, um, at Town Creek. Is this water recycled? That's a certain question. But yes. Water yes, it would. So it catches and then. It would recycle and be re uh, retreated. Yes. We would still will evaporate, yes. Sanitary issue there. It has to meet Air the same. Sale. has to meet the same criteria as you do with the pool, as far as, as far as your chemicals and that. Okay. Connie, you had a question. I did. Um, so, what's it? How, how big is that? Did, did that? Did, was that on the screen? You got those numbers? I don't remember. We just have an 800 square foot restroom, as you can see. The playing field that Becky was talking about is behind it. It's it's pretty sizable. It's hard to tell the scale, but it's it's reasonably sized. We can get that for you. Now, and this might be crazy, but I've never ever seen a splash pad. So, I mean, who has one? I like to just see. Oh, like I have one. Like I, have one. I yeah, think I that like it's closed ahead. right now because of construction. Yeah. But uh, a lot of cities have mm -hmm. At Grand National has one. Even down to the Centennial Olympic Park, the Olympic rings there are also, it's, it's kind of splash pad-esque where the water's shooting up through the rings and kids and families are running around and playing. It's meant to be a way to cool down and for people to play but not have to know how to swim. So the surface is not slippery? You've had a textured surface. Interesting. No sleeping one. Yeah, and there's a restroom building with this because we're not building the gymnasium just yet. So there's a restroom facility that needs to be built so people have somewhere to go. Because I think Ashley wants wet people dripping into the library. And <laughs> All right. Questions. So, any other questions about the Boykin Donahue campus? And then I know Councilman Griswold has some more other budget questions. No? Okay. What other questions do you have? Um, we're going to have to hire out some planning work. What are we doing on the West Auburn plan? Is that budget? 
budgeted for? No, there's not a West Auburn plan that we're using consultants for. That is, again, we were never doing a West Auburn plan. We're doing a comprehensive plan update, and it will look at that area. We're not doing an area-specific study. The West Auburn has put a comprehensive update of the whole city. We won't talk about it. Where do we stand on that? I can talk about it at the last meeting. It's very close, Kevin. <coughs> I've got it. I've said it. She's got a couple of my thoughts on me. On days? Yeah, we'll be getting okay. with you probably October time frame. Okay, thank you. Um, we're nearing, we're getting closer to having the planning director. I would also probably like to do that with him. Okay. Um, 25 we're spending 1.28 million dollars on a downtown master plan. What's that all about, please? It's on page 50. That's thousand pound master plan improvement projects in the cumulative amount. So if you go and and look on the top of page 51. That's just bumping a, a it got gateways to Auburn got mixed into that category because it had nowhere else to categorize, correct? Correct. And so that means that was seven hundred thousand dollars to potentially once our branding is done, fix all of our gateway entry signs. And then the next item is the Tumor Street Streetscape, which is We've been collecting money from the development agreement, and, and I believe that was that sidewalk easement we just did there, like the Kai House, and was also wrapped up in this. The sidewalk easement we did on the last council agenda near, or last two agendas near Langley like High on Tumor Street. Were we needing those easements for the streetscape project in the future? Tumor Street streetscape in fiscal year 25, page 51. Um, yes. So we're obligated by some development agreements to make some improvements along Tumor Street, wider sidewalks, lighting, and, and some tree wells, and that's generally what we're doing. We're getting these things for that now. And so I'm under, I'll take four six on the under uh, fire, instead of doing a building replacement. What are we replacing on the fire side uh, for? Uh, the building improvement replacement? Yeah, it's supposed to go under replacement. $25,000. They just they renovate a fire station at a time. Oh. Uh, air conditioners, roof, any cabinet, yeah. countertops, whatever's in need of repair. And that's just on a rotating basis, correct? Okay, that's it. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Matt, do you have something? Uh, I, I was looking at Enterprise on the sewer line, the, the 24, the
on the balance sheet as an asset, not as an expense or expenditure the way it is in the government. All of these the same, is it not? It's the same. And so that note at the bottom kind of oh, explains cool. that one is represented as full accrual and one is represented as a different accounting method. And so we we get that question a lot and it is very confusing. It's easier to ask if, if, we, if we're having to subsidize at all the general fund. And I, I will, we'll point that out yeah. typically. Okay. That's what I'm saying. The only consistent one is the tennis complex and that's something we need to pay one. Once in a while, environmental services, we may have to dabble. And you guys authorize a rate study, and we'll be talking about that coming up. We're getting results of the rate study, and we'll be meeting about that coming up too, as to whether or not we're looking at rate increases or not. That will be up to you. If we don't do rate increases, we will be subsidizing no matter what. And so I didn't say we're going to propose this all be on the backs of the citizens immediately, but we'll have to do something, or it all comes out of general fund. We have to we have to pick up the garbage and recycling and garbage rate and so on. Any other questions? I just got one question, and, and this goes back to the uh, MLK streetscape. That streetscape, is it, is it going to come all the way down? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, all the way up. Yes. Yeah. I think we don't see the all the house. Thank you for your staff. I know it's hard work. We appreciate this. Thank you. So we have a lot of building and all the stuff, but I hope in IT somewhere there's improvement in the search engine. Uh, <laughs> Asked for five years in the room now. <laughs> Search engine is great. Do you have anything to add to that? I mean, in terms of what you look at? Yeah, I mean, there's still some further things that we're going to do differently with how we present out the council agendas and how that becomes searchable. So to kind of differentiate where you're searching and what you're looking for. One more time, Greg, can you stand up? Couldn't hear you. Yep. Um, so we're still looking at some additional improvements and how we distribute the council information, like the packets, the RPAC packets. And then having really a research area where you can go and look for information specifically related to what has perhaps happened at a council meeting, linked to a video, and then separating that search out from the website generally, you know, how you're finding things with those websites. So, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you guys. September 5th, this will be on your agenda. That's first reading only.